Hi everyone, my name is Keen Brown. Uh, Mark Hammond and I are the founders of a startup called Bonsai. Uh, Bonsai was founded mm, two, th three years ago now. Uh, we, our goal was to vastly simplify and improve the experience of programming with arti artificial intelligence with the goal of opening this technology up to as many programmers as possible. There's an important fundamental insight uh, behind how we got here, and that's the, that's the idea of abstraction. Abstraction, an idea that's, that's core to computer science, and we, we see it over and over and over again. So we've seen it in the past when we went from transistor to transistor logic to using arithmetic logic units to full-on CPUs. We see it in, say, video games and graphics when we move from programming directly with assembly to programming with frameworks and libraries like OpenGL to full-on scripting environments like Unity where you're not dealing with, say, low-level polygon primitives. Instead, you're talking about these are the objects I want in the scene, this is the kind of physics I want and the relationship between it. It happens also in data. You know, if you think, think back a long time ago when you programmed with data, you were, you were focused on lower level data structures, a binary tree. Then we got libraries of these data structures that, that simplified and improved the process for us. Um, and eventually we had uh, programming languages like SQL, and SQL's really cool because you don't have to worry about uh, the, the underlying details of how that data is so, so, uh, stored, how the query exactly runs. Now obviously you can peer in and, and know about it if you want to, but it's not something that's thrown directly in your face as a programmer. And even with new frameworks like Hadoop and, and Spark today, uh, SQL of course is, st is still around as a way of, of programming. If we look at all these changes and, and all these levels of abstraction, we notice a pattern in terms of several benefits that appear every time we abstract or we simplify. The biggest of which, of course, is that the problems you can solve and the things you can do, it, it increases in scope. There's more of them. The, the languages just become more powerful. And you can do that in, in less time. It, with each of these frameworks, as we go up the stack, there's always new ways to reuse and sharing. So like if we, if we think of the, the library case, over time, the reuse and sharing of both the code and compiled binary units has become easier and easier. Another important point uh, from this process of abstraction is that when the abstraction is right, it also aids and simplifies the explainability. So um, it, it's interesting because we don't always, it's not always, even though uh, it's great to say look at assembly code, that doesn't always tell you exactly what a program is doing, right? It's better often to look at the, the higher level. Uh, lastly, uh, this idea of future proof, when you upgrade a database, you don't have to rerun or recompile your entire system. Instead, you just upgrade the database and then you immediately get all the benefits, all the performance increases uh, 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 of that without having to change your code. Um, at Bonsai, our goal is to, to, to bring some of this to AI. And when we looked across the market today, um, we so, sort of saw three approaches to how people were programming with AI and machine learning. The most common of which are things like toolkits. This is your, your H2O or your TensorFlow. Um, these, these toolkits are great because they give you incredible amounts of control, uh, but they're not very explainable. And pretty much every time a new algorithm comes out, you have to throw away the code you wrote and, and write a new model. Another group we call statistical analysis packages. These are products ranging from, say, like um, R in a certain sense, or in particular, data robot. This is where you feed a bunch of data in, or you, you, you set up something, and a model can get generated for you. And this is great in that it's very easy to use, uh, but it has the problem of once that model's generated, if you want to change it, you're right back into working directly with a toolkit. Uh, but now it's much more complicated because the model itself was machine generated. APIs definitely hit a sweet spot here in that I think they're the easiest to program with, but of course the problem is, is that they only do that specific slice of functionality. So if what you have is a simple problem that can be solved by ImageNet, like tell me what objects are on this table, you're fine. But uh, you know, we've talked to customers that are like, I need, uh, can you tell me when, the, when this board comes off the line whether it has a tombstone capacitor? Tombstone capacitors, of course, are not in the, the lexicon of, of ImageNet, and so they end up back in the toolkit category. So at Bonsai, we began thinking of, is there another approach? Is there another way to do this? And what we came uh, into is our idea of machine teaching. 
machine teaching being sort of the complement of machine learning. In machine learning, you're often focused on describing the details of a student, of a, of a learning system and how that system learns. Uh, and, and the underlying algorithm, the underlying mechanics of how it gets learned. And we, give, we often give right now short shrift to the part that is with the data. Now, obviously, there's a lot of cleaning work that's done. But at the end of the day, we're usually throwing data at the algorithm and then hoping it learns, basically, testing it to see if it learns and then adjusting the data. With machine teaching, the process is about formalizing that. Can we instead shift the thinking around from programming the details of the learner to instead programming the teacher, to staging the way things get knowledge is shared. And, and, and this core idea, machine teaching, it forms the basis for our framework and the way it works. Now with, relation, with databases, the core idea was around relational algebra. It's like what are the entities in this database? What are the relationships between them? It raises the interesting question in machine teaching, what is the, what is the approach? What are the core ideas? And so we've, we've identified several core ideas that we believe form, form a basis to, to a new approach. One is the idea of concepts. What is it that I want the computer to learn? And what are the relationships between, between those concepts? Uh, to, to make an appeal here uh, for a moment to um, the game of baseball, if I were to take my daughter and I were to teach her to play baseball, uh, I wouldn't start by setting her there and she's two, almost three, so she's still young for all this. But I wouldn't set her there and I'd throw a bunch of fastballs at her, right? I would actually stage, as, uh, yes, as, a, as amusing as that might be to some, but the, uh, um, I would stage the process, right? I would start, I'd put the ball maybe on a tee and we'd start with a wiffle ball on a bat and then I'd have it pop up, et cetera, et cetera. And I know this is an intuitive p appeal, but it's very interesting right now that when we program with machine learning or AI systems, we tend to, to program that way. We tend to throw all the data at it and figure out what, what will go on. Um, but as I'll show you here in a moment, if we, if we stage that, if we tier that, we can actually get dif different results um, out of the model. Uh, so, so for each concept in our system, we have a curriculum. And the curriculum is about, OK, well, the, the concept is what you want to teach. The curriculum is how you, how you teach that. What is the lesson plan to follow to, to ease acquisition and, and mastery? And along with these uh, curriculums there's, and lessons, they're, they're tied to what we call training sources. And in our system, something that's interesting is that we, we support multiple kinds of training data. So uh, this tabular data on the right is something we're used to. But if you think of, say, teaching people, um, synthetic data is, is incredibly useful. So um, if you, you think when you were a kid, when you were to learn, uh, when you learned to read time, you didn't necessarily learn from, OK, let's wait 10 minutes and see what the clock says from real world data. Instead, you could generate lots of data instances, and those were instructive. Likewise, simulations, and I'll show you, like uh, the, in our product, a lot of the focus is on reinforcement learning, so we have a lot, a lot of simulations in our system. Um, simulations, that kind of synthetic data can help. And really, ideally, right, we can weave these different data types together. Um, when we don't have data, we can use some synthetic, synthetic data to bootstrap ourselves into the position we want to be in um, and then train on the real data once we, once we have a, a basic model working. Um, so let's, let's actually take a look here at our product. So this is, I'm going to show you a few different in interfaces here that we, we've built and we're playing with to give you an idea of, of what we do. So we have these things called brains. They're basically models. And I can create a new one. And in, in this case, I'm going to have the AI play an open AI video game. It's sort of the, a hello world of reinforcement learning. It's, it's a game called cart pole. So think of a Segway scooter. There's a pole on a cart. And the cart wants to balance the pole so it stays, so it stays on top. So um, like this, I can create a brain. And um, our web application right now does let you train on the server. But because I want folks to be able to see the simulation, I'm going to go ahead and, and pull this down onto my local machine. Um, So this, this main file here I'll get into in a second. This is, uh, this is the intelligence behind this, this carpool game. Here, let me, let me actually start it up for you so you can get an idea of what we're talking about. Well, 
that start up and get running. There we go, that's it. Trying, trying to learn there for a second. So Carpool, it, there's not really a lot of concepts behind this. In this particular system, um, there's one, there's balance. And we're gonna take data that comes from the simulation. We're gonna learn to balance this pole and a control action that balances this pole and we're gonna feed that to output. Uh, in, our, in our programming language here, you can see that uh, it's types. So we have these schemas. These types are very interesting in our language. We have a type language, which is unusual these days, I think, um, largely because it provides a hint, one of several hints that we use to decide what kind of learning architecture to lay out. Uh, knowing the range of the types and the types of values it ex expects. The meat of the program is actually really down here. It's in these, these bottom lines where it has the concept. And what we're saying here is, hey, there's a concept. I want to teach you how to balance something. You're going to classify this. It's going to be a control action. The action is, is up here. This is a weird thing or an interesting feature here of the, of the, of the, of the system. The, this type here basically saying I only want a zero. I want you to encode this as an eight bit int, but I want you to know that a zero, either, encode, either enter a zero or a one. Um, so go left or go right for controlling the cart. Uh, we have some other interesting data types like uh, luminance that's part of that hinting system for having the system learn using computer vision. This one concept here um, basically takes that data from input, uh, learns something and sends it to output. When we declare a concept, we have to declare a lesson. And so this lesson actually uh, plays the cart pole Python game um, that from OpenAI gym, maximizing a specific reward function that's, that's in that gym. So you can see over here, um, starting to begin to learn, we have several visualization systems in the product that are kind of interesting. This one tracks uh, the learning, uh, the accuracy of the system, cumulative reward over time. Uh, this actually keeps track of um, the signals that are coming to and from the control system over time. Uh, this is part of investment we're generally making in trying to make the, these systems, reinforcement learning systems, more debuggable. I'm going to leave reinforcement learning real quick. So while that's our primary focus, uh, we have we started off with prototypes with with MNIST, sort of the true hello world of. Uh, of, of deep learning. And so through that, I can sort of explore some, some uh, interesting features. So in that case, we had one concept, but you could actually think, well, um, what, about, what about MNIST? Is, that, is there something there where multi-concept would help? And the answer is MNIST is so, so solved, no. <laughs> it doesn't help. However, there's a data set called not MNIST, which is this one. Um, recognize that this is an A, right? Um, where uh, the, the state-of-the-art algorithms don't do so well. And to make this more interesting, we actually took these uh, letters and we, we translated them, rotated them, and scaled them. So we basically built like CAPTCHA uh, for, for the system to solve. And one of the things we find, uh, so you, you'll give it this, this program. And in this program, what I'm basically saying is, hey, look, I think you'd have a better chance at guessing what that character is if first you think about how much it's rotated how much it's scaled, and how much it's translated. So these are basically learned features. You can think of them like learned, learned features in, in, a, in a pipeline. And in our system, this will lay out a network that looks like this. Under the hood, we use TensorFlow for basically um, all the algorithms. And so we can use TensorBoard. And this kind of looks like compiler output. It's like a bunch of um, deep learning algorithms laid out uh, under it. And, sh and sure enough, um, with this approach, um, you, can, you can beat the default approach if you were just use it, use it raw. And that, that intuitively makes sense, right? Because we're using features here. Now, this problem um, gets, uh, the, or I guess the, the first thing to share is there's other interesting things you can do in our system. So I talked about these learn nodes, these concepts. Um, we also have done work to support more deterministic sort of calculations. Um, we have these stream statements here where you can use a SQL-like syntax. You can use link to change or, or mutate the data in the data stream. Uh, we also have a feature called gears that allows you to directly import Python models um, and use those as nodes or concepts in this, in this stream of data. The, the problem starts to get really interesting, in my opinion, when we start to uh, deal with behavior. So um, let me show you, um, this, is, this is Lunar Lander. And um, in this particular model, what I'm saying is, I think 
The system would behave more intelligently if first it learned how to stay stable and learned how to go to a point, and then after that, it learned how to land. Uh, and you can see that for each of these concepts here that are in the code, you also have to author specific lessons with each of their own objective function. In this particular case in Python, I've coded the objectives so you know what is being stable. Being stable is not, not rotating left or right, and so you're rewarding it on its ability to hold it at a specific angle. And I can give you a video clip here of what that looks like. So here is the behavior when untrained. You can see it's sort of floundering all over the, the place. Here is the behavior for just stay stable. Now notice it's not like landing yet. That's what we actually wanted to do. But what it is doing is it's holding a, it's holding a position in, in space, a rotation in space. Uh, this one was trained for go to center, so you can see it here flying to a point. It's up at the top of the screen because the, the, the reward is not saying, you know, go land yet. And finally, we can composite these together into a single land operation, which is pretty neat. So there, there you go. Now, the, this also reduces scope. So, so if you try to go solve this with DDPG, um, it'll take 100 some odd thousand iterations or episodes rather to solve. Uh, we can do it in, uh, in 10,000, a little under 10,000 using this approach. The, uh, there's another interesting thing here, though. So let's go back to that graph for a second. So I talked about um, a couple important capabilities that was a benefit of abstraction. So one of those benefits is explainability. And what's interesting here is that you can see sort of I've given it, now that I've given the system a conceptual hierarchy for thinking about the problem, I also have the ability to ask questions. So for example, for each frame that you're getting of this game, can you tell me back what you were thinking in that moment. So basically, could you give me back the outputs for these antecedent uh, neural networks? And so um, you can see actually here where the, now the pro, we, we have a name. So for the process of compositing these behaviors, that's a learn process. So basically, the system can say for every frame of state, what is the correct set of behavior to compose? We call that process selection and synthesis. And we can actually graph that um, in the window here where this is representing how much attention is being given to those bi different behaviors, those different skills as the system, as a system uh, lear learns to land. Um, the other interesting property of this, and this is not yet implemented in our system, is that these become reusable blocks or reusable units. So some of those, maybe like landing, are only useful for one specific activity. But you could imagine things like going to XY or staying stable to be generally useful, something that you could reuse. And so training time, our goal is to make it so that training time invested in any one of those blocks becomes a reusable component that you can use over and over and over again within an application. And let me see. OK. I'll go back to here. Um, so as you can see from, from the, the way the system is today, um, the, our focus really is applying reinforcement learning to problems. Um, we found particular resonance with that approach with, uh, with what we call industrial AI. So um, our largest customer, with our largest customer Siemens, we work on certain cyber physical systems related to manufacturing for controlling and optimizing their use. Um, we, we're also uh, working on problems in supply chain management, predictive maintenance, things like this related to industrial AI. Uh, we have an early access program, so you can, you can come and sign up uh, and, and, and check us out. So that was a super quick tour, but I wanted to open it up to questions. If anyone has questions, I'll have a mic up at the front here. And you can just come up and ask your question to Keen.